Pan American World Airways announces the arrival of flight 141 from France. Yeah, I just got in, flew back from Nice. <laughs> Say, you ought to see me, I'm surrounded by my loot. Yes, we flew over on the President flight by way of England, and then we flew to the continent and took some side trips to Luxembourg and Switzerland and uh, Italy. But we spent most of the time in France and finally ended up on the Riviera. No, we flew back by the southern route from Nice, so we could see Spain and Porto. It was the best vacation I ever had. Yes, I know. Well, she did want to go by boat. But when it boiled itself down, boat in two countries, or a plane in five countries, I didn't have to do too much persuading. Say, sis, you ought to see those new double-decked clippers. Sleepers upstairs and a lounge as big as your living room downstairs. Interesting people. Well, I should say so. You know, we were down in the lounge just a few hours out of New York. Oh, I'll be out in the middle of the street. Uh, would you like a canopy? Oh, thank you. Thank you. They look good. Are you responsible? No, they're made in New York. Our steward here puts the finishing touches on them. Oh, now you're Mr. and Mrs. James, and you're on your way to... Paris. Paris? You'll have lunch there tomorrow. That's right. Isn't that wonderful? Where are we now? Oh, we're flying at 18,000 feet now, above the weather. 18,000 feet? Gosh, I wasn't conscious we were climbing at all. Well, that's because the air pressure in the cabin is the same as at sea level. And say, we ought to transfer you to the publicity department. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't mind, but I like flying better. Well, that's the way it started. And before the evening was over, we'd met a half a dozen people that we wanted to know better. The steward and stewardess were certainly on their toes. Yeah. Well, you know, I was always sold on flying, but it was the sleeping that cinched the deal for Donnie. The berths are big, big as your bed. Yeah, never slept better in my life. And the next morning, there we were in... <laughs> Yes, here we were in Paris. A complete new life before us. Another world, another life. Donnie couldn't wait to get some pictures of the Arc de Triomphe and promptly got herself trapped in traffic. Jaywalking in Times Square is safe compared to this. Monsieur, Monsieur, News our Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower? Quand we saw news our Eiffel Tower? <laughs> oh, come on, bon, bon. No, 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 no. Eiffel Tower. Oh, les petites pas. Cabaret? Oh, no, 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 no. Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower. Oh, tout est ça. Oui, oui. 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 Oui, for a ride, circuitous perhaps, but a wonderful preview of Paris. Down the magnificent Champs-Élysées, a mile of smart shops, cafes, and theaters. The sidewalks are nearly as broad as the avenue, and to stroll here on Sunday is one of the things to do. The Champs-Élysées runs into the Place de la Concorde where in 1793 the guillotine took nearly 3,000 lives. Now it's a beautiful square and fountain spray where the tumbrils once rolled. But that's Paris for you, so vivacious, so resilient that unpleasantness is soon forgotten. Past the world-famous Café de la Paix on Opera Square, the heart of the city's bustle, and in the center, the Opera House itself, rich in memories, ancient and sweet. I can hardly guess what this city means to others who see it for the first time. For us, it was filled with a thousand memories of all that Paris has meant in the human drama. The ghosts of Voltaire, Dumas, and Robespierre walk the streets, if you look for them. But no matter what you're looking for, you'll find it here, 
every mood, every environment, all crammed into one bubbling city. We drove out into the Tuileries Gardens. Oh, how lovely was Paris in this month of June. The books were right. It is the most brilliant visitor city in the world. We arrived at the Palais de Chaillot, in whose broad wings are several museums, a library, and a theater. On the terrace here, Hitler strutted for the newsreels in 1940 and gazed at the Eiffel Tower just across the Seine. The tower always reminded me of something Paul Bunyan might have built with a giant erector set. The view of Paris that surpasses all others is from the top of this tower. We took the slow-moving elevator and was it slow? We careened wildly upwards with all the reckless fury of an anemic snail. But it was fun to see the outskirts of the city slowly coming into sight as the Palais de Chaillot, which we just left, got smaller and smaller. Well, here we are at the top, almost a thousand feet up, with the breathtaking panorama of Paris spread out below us like a beautiful abstract painting. Then, back to Earth again, and from a boat on the Seine, the river that threads the canvas of Paris like a sinuous ribbon, we saw the tower from another angle. Nowhere is the difference between Europe and America clearer than in the aspect of the rivers. In Europe, man has done his best to beautify them. To me, the Seine is the most vital element in the beauty of Paris. Beautiful to walk across, to ride along, to fish in, to sail on, and the French have made the most of it. Everyone should take this boat trip. You not only see new things, you see old things from new angles, such as the Cathedral of Notre Dame. France was hit by a tidal wave of faith in the 12th century, and it left some of the most beautiful cathedrals that man has ever built. They say that where a man's heart is, there will his treasure be also. And these churches were clearly built by men whose whole heart was in the task. They were built not by outside contractors, but by the monks and parishioners themselves, to whom the building became a symbol of the meaning of their lives. You can look at Notre Dame from several points of view. With your artist's eye, you can marvel at the sculpture and how wonderfully it's integrated with the architecture. Or you can conjure up the famous people who've come here to pray, or be crowned, or buried, or perhaps even see the hunchback lurking behind Jan Gorgoyle. As an artist, you will appreciate the rose winds ever been able to do what these men did with color. Just across the bridge by Notre Dame on the left bank, we found the bookstalls. At one time, literary men gathered here to discuss the wit and fashionable writing of the day. But today, students and tourists seem to be the most frequent visitors. A favorite spot for relaxing is the sidewalk cafe. Here on the left bank, students scrape together pennies for one drink, which lets them sit there all day, talking, writing, sometimes even studying. At the flea market, you can buy anything you want, from lovely old antiques to the latest sheet music. Leal is called the stomach of Paris. To provide the city with enough food for a day's eating is an enormous undertaking, especially since they don't go in for packaged, canned, or frozen things the way we do. Everything must be fresh each day. Even late in the morning, Leal is bubbling with life. Then the small buyers come to get a sprig of parsley or a scallion for the potage or bouillabaisse or some other incomparable concoction that's given the French an international reputation for tempting the taste buds. 
One place to sample French food at its Epicurean best is the Tour d'Argent, one of the most famous restaurants in Paris. Celebrities from the time of Henry VIII have enjoyed the place. George Sand, Anatole France, Edmund Rostand, Sarah Bernhardt, to mention only a few. Their specialty here is pressed duck. But whatever you have, what will impress you most is the waiters. Paris is a city of waiters. French food we have in America, but French waiters we have not. Montmartre sits high on a hill overlooking Paris and is reached by a funicular railroad. Perhaps you've heard more about Montmartre than any other part of Paris. This is where Picasso and Utrillo lived and where Toulouse-Lautrec painted Demi Mondaines. Don't expect to find a patches and vice dens. It's a charming, folksy place with narrow streets, jumbled old facades that lean crazily out over the pavement, and cabarets filled with music and song, mostly furnished by the patrons. The building that dominates the whole beauty of Montmartre is a church, the Sacred Heart Cathedral. You see it up every little street you look, and to me it has a subduing influence on anyone too strongly pleasure-bent. No, Montmartre is no more wicked than Greenwich Village in New York, and I must admit we were a bit disappointed not to see even one absent drinker. But Donnie loved the quaint little shops and advises a daytime as well as a nighttime visit. Near the cathedral, we met some friendly art students. Who knows, in their voluble midst may dwell the Cezanne or the Matisse of the day after tomorrow. The only bunch of fans here. Yeah. 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 What do you do? I'm a musician, a pianist. Oh, she's really a model. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, nice. Mais alors, Virgil, qu'est-ce que vous faites comme travail? Décorateur. Mais moi, encore toujours de travail, je travaille comme ouvrier chez un entrepreneur. Boulot, boulot. Ah, je comprends. Mais qu'est-ce que tu fais? Quand il ne fait pas de décoration, il travaille pour un builder. Oh, je vois. To eat. To eat. Eat, did he say? That's for me. I was always thinking of eating in Paris. So I arranged to meet Donnie at the Moulin de la Galette, that famous old mill that dates back to the seventh century. While we ate, we listened to a charming song about Paris in the spring. Time in Paris, in the Tuileries, green lawns fresh with dew, riot of color, in the flower market, symphony, springtime in Paris, pastels mixed with gray, soft light in the twilight, and all the lovers walk on the Seine in the sunset. Springtime in Paris. Face powder perfumes the Champs-Élysées. In the Luxembourg Gardens, the words of forever on lips intoxicated with love. If you told me I could bring back one custom from France and only one, I'd choose sidewalk cafes. It's such a pleasant place to meet your friends and watch the passing parade. We have nothing to compare with it, unless you count the corner drugstore. What a contrast. Donnie had picked up a map on the Pan American plane and was all excited about visiting the Chateau country. So, the next morning, we took one of those wonderful Swedish buses and started out. These Swedish buses were as fine as anything I'd ever seen. We took our last look at the city, so charming, so unravaged, and bore away a memory that will remain with us always as part of our life's unalterable good.
Our first stop was at the Chateau of Versailles, about 20 miles out of Paris, probably the most regal of all royal edifices in the world. To really appreciate the place, one should have studied a little French history. Versailles has been the scene of some of the most colorful and some of the most tragic events of the past 300 years. Louis XIV created Versailles out of nothing, not only to show what a great king could do and how he should live, but to provide a setting so magnificent, so dazzling, that no Frenchman of consequence could afford to stay away from it. As many as 10,000 people have been housed and fed here at one time. Not to be at court in those days meant either that you were a person of no consequence or that you had incurred the royal wrath. The gardens were the background for innumerable spectacles. There are rockeries and colonnades and fountains. You come on them unexpectedly, and some are incredibly beautiful like this sunken garden with a waterfall made of shells. It must have been the scene of ballets and picnics and all sorts of happy times. We were a little sorry we hadn't lived in those days. We must come again for the interiors, for Versailles is so extensive that a whole afternoon is hardly enough to see the gardens alone. Before the time of Louis XIV, the Valley of the Loire was the heart of the French monarchy. The great chateaus still stand today like the tombstones of a glory that has vanished. They dot the banks of the river within easy riding distance of each other. There is Amboise, where Leonardo da Vinci is buried. And here's the chateau at Blois, one of the most beautiful of the old royal residences. Like most, it started as a fortress. Then Louis XII built this wing in the 15th century Gothic style. There's Louis in stone over the portal. The place is full of memories. This is where Francois Villon composed verses with his fellow poet Charles d'Orléans, and where Catherine de' Medici ended her terrible life. When you cross the threshold, you step right into the brilliant movement of the French Renaissance, the period that produced most of the great chateaus. One of its finest achievements was this superb spiral staircase built by Francis I. Not far away is one of the best examples of the charm of the French Renaissance architecture, the delightful chateau of Azay le Rideau. It's just the sort of place you imagine Sleeping Beauty slept in. And Balzac really did sleep here often, so they told us. A short drive away is Chanonceau, the chateau Henry II gave to his sweetheart, Diane de Poitiers. Catherine de' Medici, always jealous of Diane, forced her to give up Chanonceau when Henry died. When she took over, she topped the bridge with this elaborate gallery and also threw some parties that topped the orgies of Nero. Chambord was built by Francis I because he liked to hunt hereabouts. What a hunting lodge. 375 rooms to hang your trophies in. In the same section is Villandry, famed for its beautiful 16th century gardens. As we counted the places we'd seen, we realized the value of pilgrimages. No amount of reading or study can produce the same effect on the spirit as actually seeing these places, realizing that they are really there much the same as they were when Rabelais saw them. Everyone should come to the Chateau country, and with plenty of time to wander over the region slowly. It's a profound experience, and its joy will remain with you as long as you live. The region around Bordeaux produces the finest wines in the world, and has since Roman times. The culture of grapes has, through the centuries, developed into a fine art, and every step from pruning to spraying has a special technique. If you like places that haven't been overrun by tourists, here's your spot. You'll find not only good wine, but superb food. Almost every man in Bordeaux is a connoisseur of food and drink. And the chef of a charming restaurant told us that good wine pleases all four senses, 
lovely to look at, to smell, to taste, and it even sings. And then to the walled city of Carcassonne, what a spot. You'd never believe it existed unless you'd seen it. Carcassonne was built first by the Romans, and during its turbulent history passed through many hands, each one leaving his additions to the fortifications. When, in the 13th century, it passed to the French crown, the fortress was so strengthened it became impregnable. What makes it unique is that it is in a wonderful state of preservation, and many people still live within its walls, where there is an excellent hotel and a beautiful Gothic church. Not one, but two walls of masonry surround the whole affair. The drawbridge is just as it was 1,000 years ago, but the inhabitants don't pull it up and down now, since the only marauding forces these days are tourists, who are comparatively harmless. From the battlements, you can see the new town of Carcassonne, which lies at the base of the fortress. One last admonition. Be sure to see Carcassonne by moonlight, for it is then that the ghosts of the past rise around you, and you may hear the distant scream of a dying attacker, or the gay tinkling laughter of ladies in waiting. But apart from that, Carcassonne by moonlight is one of the most unforgettably beautiful sights you will ever have the opportunity to see. I've been enthusiastic about so much in France that I sound like a travel folder, but truthfully, we felt that way about it. And the Riviera. I had no idea it was so beautiful or so extensive. I thought it was a small resort, the Idle Rich. Actually, the Riviera stretches for some 200 miles along the coast of the Mediterranean, and there's every kind of scenery and every kind of town and village to fit every kind of budget. Nice, brisk and modern, gay and carefree, is the biggest city on the Riviera, and a proper place for just being lazy and dreamy and unconscious of time. We spent a day at Cannes basking in the sun and wondering how we ever got the idea that the Riviera was either exclusive or expensive. For every duke or prince or nabob, there are hundreds of people like us who come with their families just to bask in the sun. We spent another day touring around gasping at the scenery. At Joie Pain, we ate and drank and danced and swam and uh, ate and drank and danced and swam and in between watched other people do the same. Did you ever try water jousting? It's a popular sport in France. If I hadn't seen this my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it. Imagine tent villages on the Riviera. And all these years I've been afraid to show my face here because my income was definitely not in the upper bracket. For those who like water sports, this is an ideal spot because the Mediterranean is usually as smooth as glass. Furthermore, there's such splendid scenery. At least I thought so. Donnie suggested rather pointedly that water skiing was not purely a spectator sport, and why didn't I stop looking and start skiing? Well, I did. And nobody was more surprised than I to discover that it was really quite easy. After a few hours of practice, I found I could do just as well as the experts. On the 14th of July, like our 4th, there was much music and dance and fireworks and a parade in native costume of people who had come from miles around for the folk festival.
We saw the Lesians do a charming maple dance. Dancers from Auvergne had plenty of spirit. The costumes of the dancers from Brittany were as interesting as the dance. From the Pyrenees, the gaiety of the Basques was contagious. We resorted to all sorts of pretexts for spinning out our stay, but finally our excuses ran out. We join for the last time in one of those spontaneous bits of merrymaking that are so characteristic of the French. We left a little of our hearts behind, but we took away a memory. We had had a happy time in France, and we knew that we would be happy 20 years hence in the memory of it.